If I could sum up the entirety of this episode in one word, it would be shameless. I'm not going to sit here and lampshade this. Secret Swapper of Doom is the culmination of every glaring problem involved with blatant stealing from the original series. The fact that there have been so many episodes that repeat exactly what the original show has done is not a coincidence. I refuse to believe that. There is very little that can convince me that the similarities between Secret Swapper and Lying Around the House were sheer coincidence, and that the reboot writers had no idea that the season 5 episode from the original already did everything that this episode delivers to us. These two are the exact same episode. Rip off artist! Ow! My shit! Let me elaborate by using a little analogy here. Watching Secret Swapper and Lying Around the House is like looking at a picture of Zack and Cody. Sure, you can see some minor differences in their facial structure and hairstyle, but aside from those very minute details, they look almost exactly the same because they're identical twins. That's what these episodes are. But unlike these two, who were only born a few minutes apart, Secret Swapper came into this world a whopping 12 years after Lying did. I will again reference this specific article in which the producers openly admit that they are fans of the original series and that they referred to it for ideas. If this was a one-time thing and there weren't so many other examples of stolen ideas out there, I'd probably let this one slide and queue it up to pure happenstance. But since that's not the case, I'm not going to sit here and keep quiet about how much this bothers me. If they wanted this show to have a new identity, why did they do the exact same thing that the old show did? That's not new. There's no twist. There's no spin. The only difference between these episodes is that Secret Swapper relies on secrets instead of lies. Otherwise, the story progression, the manifestation and defeat of the monster, the ultimate Aesop, everything about this episode is a one-to-one exact exact copy. I can't defend this. There's nothing I can say that can justify blatant recycling of an episode. And believe me, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. But this is just so lazy. But that's the biggest problem I have with this episode. It's sheer lack of creativity and obviously stolen ideas. I'm not exactly surprised because shows reusing ideas that have been done before isn't anything new, but the fact that this has happened so frequently from the own franchise no less is why this is such a prevalent issue. You don't see Teen Titans Go stealing things from the original series every other episode. Yeah, despite all the problems that people may have with that series, I can at least respect it for doing things that have never been done before in the animated Teen Titans mythos. Yet another reason why I think it's better than the reboot. Well, despite the skeletal structure of the episode being a direct copy, let's see if those minor differences I was referring to earlier can make up the difference. Ha ha ha, I'm just kidding, it can't. Secret Swapper begins its story with the Ugh. Professor going through a bunch of his old belongings from his younger days and looking back fondly on those nostalgic memories of when he was a kid. You know, it's scary how I'm only 20 years old at the time of making this review, and yet I can already relate to this. The girls decide to show up and ask the professor what he's doing, with Bubbles discovering the professor's private journal and begging to know what's inside. Okay, so we have some basic foreshadowing here. The episode presents us with a very specific item that's going to be important later on based on the way Bubbles mentions this thing twice during the opening act. It may be a bit obvious, okay, it's actually very obvious, but it gets the job done. I'm also keen on how Professor Utonium mentions the word secret in passing as it is a good way to sneak in that buzzword that also appeared in the title card. Again, foreshadowing that this journal will make another appearance later on. Despite her persistence, the professor refuses to let Bubbles read his private journal and sends them off to school where we see Blossom is passed a pop quiz with shining colors, as should be expected from a character like her. Bubbles, unfortunately, wasn't nearly as prepared. And you fail! And so with that, the important side character of this episode shows up along with the plot important item that takes up the title of this episode, his secret swapper. It functions when a character tells it a secret, giving the user the answer to any question that they may ask it. Bubbles is all for this and openly gives this guy her wallet without a second thought, but Blossom and Buttercup are a bit skeptical, as they should be. A piece of paper can't predict the future. Yeah, only Goat Stradamus can do that. <laughs> I get it! I don't get it. You know, as a side note, I think this episode could have actually done a whole hidden moral thing about doing drugs here, considering the next character to show up and speak with the girls is the perfect fit for a drug dealer. Now, I'm not saying this episode is bad because it doesn't do that, I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of parallels here that they could have capitalized on. The sketchy situation of kids by the lockers, this guy's design with the hair covering his one eye and mysterious appearance out of thin air, the fact that he's essentially exchanging the secret swapper for cash, everything's already there, why not just go for it? I suppose if 
if you look at it close enough, you could make the argument that the episode does do this, but considering this idea is overshadowed by the whole invasion of privacy moral at the end, it feels as though this idea was just left open. It's more like a missed opportunity than anything else. And so, the girls decide to give the Swapper a shot after Buttercup gives Malin a name drop. You know, that girl she hung out with from the Derby Taunts? Hmm, a nice subtle reference to another episode of the series. And Blossom asks the piece of paper if Jared Shapiro likes her. What? Uh, she already knows the answer to this question. I'm pretty sure that the events of Snow Month established this fact, considering it was his premiere episode, and this show does have a set continuity that it wants to follow if the production order and Green Lantern powers are any indication. Most of you have already heard my feelings towards Fucky McFuckboy himself, but in case you haven't, go watch my Snow Month review. Please. Next, we get a montage where the girls find that the Swapper works for them after all and take it all around town using it to win all sorts of things like a giant teddy bear and a car and whatnot. I can at least commend the composer of this song that plays over the sequence as I actually got it stuck in my head after watching the episode. In a good way. Anyone else getting some major Sonic Colors vibes from this? The only thing I really dislike about this song is that it does end kind of abruptly. Wow. I don't know, it just feels like the last line should have been a bit longer if you ask me. I did like the Let's Make a Deal reference too. Question number one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Question number one. This is worth 500. <laughs> Time out for a second here. Uh, this has been bugging me ever since I really started this review, but I've never heard anyone in my life call this thing a swapper. Am I wrong to say that most people call this a fortune teller? I've never heard of the term swapper before, and I don't think paper fortune teller is copywritten or whatever, so... What gives? Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup arrive home from the secret swapper splurging spree with all of the stuff they won while simultaneously praising this piece of origami for telling them everything they wanted to know. Just when the girls' lives seem to be perfect in every single way, an advertisement for three space tow truck earrings appears on TV that immediately catches their attention. All someone has to do in order to win is to guess the code of the safe keeping them inside. Though, anyone with common sense will quickly realize that the odds of that happening are almost as likely as winning the lottery. Sure, it's most certainly possible and it could happen, but it's very, very unlikely. This leads the three to try and find another secret to tell the fortune teller so that they can win the earrings, but as it turns out, they're all out of secrets. How convenient. Yes, it's quite convenient that the professor conveniently walks by and conveniently drops the convenient journal that conveniently holds all of the convenient secrets that he's conveniently written down so that the girls can conveniently tell the secret swapper that conveniently runs on secrets all of the convenient secrets that it conveniently holds conveniently. Man, convenient doesn't even sound like a word anymore, what the heck? All sarcasm aside, I respected the episode for the foreshadowing from earlier, and this scene right here is what it was all leading up to. It's honestly fine. What isn't fine is what happens right after. Remember what the professor is always telling us? Girls, I trust you'll save the mayor. Trust, trust, it's all about trust. Break it and you'll spontaneously combust. Stop it. Get some help. Here's the problem with the rap jokes. It wasn't funny the first time. If it's not funny the first time, why would it be funny the second, or the third, or the fourth? Do you see what I'm saying? If they change their approach and do something different, then maybe one of these jokes could be a hit. And don't get me wrong, I fully believe that comedy is subjective. Maybe there's someone somewhere out there that enjoys this kind of stuff, and that's fine. But I don't see it, and I know there are a lot of other people out there who don't see it either. But I digress, the girls tell the secret swapper literally everything they can find in the professor's journal without any success. Which is weird that it just stopped working for them so suddenly, considering everything else was going so well beforehand. Oh, wait, it suddenly becomes sentient and transformed into a giant paper dinosaur. You don't see that every day. Run! It's Godzilla! It looks like Godzilla, but due to international copyright laws, it's not. Still, we should run like it is Godzilla! Though it isn't. This giant origami dinosaur monster then runs into Townsville to start wreaking mayhem and destruction, which is actually a nice sight to see considering the last time we've seen a monster terrorize the town in this show was, hmm, let me see here. Oh yeah, Arachno Romance 18 episodes ago. You could make the argument for Mojo's onion monster and In the Garden, but Mojo was in control of that thing and it didn't take place in the city, so I consider it its own separate category. 
It's fine if you do, though. As with most of these reboot episodes that I've reviewed, the final act of this episode is where everything pretty much falls apart. See, the secret swapper starts running around everywhere, spilling the professor's secrets to everyone once he gets into the city, because that's, uh, evil? I mean, yeah, I guess it's vile to just spill someone's personal life like that, but in the grand scheme of things, what harm does this actually cause? This whole origami monster's motive is a bit unclear here. After all the secrets are spilled, what's it gonna do? Is it just gonna go down the block and grab a drink at the local bar, or what? Also, two fun things about this frame here. One, we have another instance of the show staff being inserted as a placeholder name, and two, that movie title is apparently a reference to an obscure biography known as, and I apologize for the mispronunciation, Aurangzeb, The Man in the Myth. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure someone has. And we again see the citizens of Townsville showing no sympathy and being total assholes to the professor for virtually no reason other than making fun of his own expense. Jerks. Thing is, these secrets aren't even that bad. I heard you still check to see if there's monsters in your closet! Eh, that's fair, I guess. I mean, when I was younger, I learned that there was actually just a friendly darkness guy in there who really likes to play cheese and crackers, but other than that, there isn't much else in there. I heard you sing show tunes in the shower! Okay, who doesn't do that? Let's be honest here. I heard the professor's in love with his pillow, Dr. Fluffenstein! I can't actually defend that one. It's pretty pathetic. But like, all of these things that show up in the background, I'm sorry, they're really not that embarrassing. He snores like a lot of people do. He likes turtlenecks, which there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, and this is my favorite one by far. I laugh even when I don't get the joke. Oh, the irony. This one was genuinely good though. I like that. Due to all of his secrets being spilled, the professor runs home crying while the monster proceeds to tell the world all of the secrets that the girls told it, only for Bubbles to beat him to the punch when she reveals that she's the one that's been pranking Buttercup all this time. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention earlier in the episode there's this scene where Bubbles pranks Buttercup by putting confetti in her locker. I didn't think it was really that worthy of note to mention then, so I just thought I'd bring it up now. As if the lying around the house parallels weren't obvious enough already, this is what seals the deal. When Bubbles reveals the truth behind the secret, the monster shrinks and loses a little bit of his power, leading Blossom to realize that telling the world their secrets before he does causes him to become weaker. Okay. Hold up, let's think about this monster for a second here. So it is clearly established as the episode develops that this thing comes from a supernatural paper fortune teller that works its magic by absorbing the secrets of its user and then performing a function to help the user achieve their goal. In this sense, the monster is essentially growing in power as it absorbs more and more secrets that the girls tell it, thus allowing it to eventually take on the gigantic dinosaur form to destroy the city as seen in the third act of the episode. I think we can all agree that a secret is essentially a tidbit of knowledge that only a select handful of people know about, something that is kept from being common knowledge among a larger group of people such as a class or a community. It is also shown to us, the viewers, that the girls are able to figure out how to defeat the monster by complete accident. Apparently, all they have to do is spill their secrets to the world before the monster does because then they will no longer be secrets. Which makes perfect sense. If the girls tell the world all their secrets that they shared with the swapper, then those statements become common knowledge and nullify the secludedness that makes the secret a secret. Therefore, the swapper would lose power because that's one less secret it has giving it strength. Problem. And when I say this is a problem, I mean this is a big problem. Why does the swapper go around telling the professor's secrets to the world? Based on everything that I just elaborated on, would you not agree that this swapper should be weakening itself every single time it says something about his personal life? He's telling the world things that people didn't know. He's ruining the secretive aspect of the statement, and thus it is no longer a secret. Therefore, he has one less secret giving him power, ergo, he is essentially destroying himself. This, to me, is a major oversight on this creature's actions. Why would this thing be able to tell secrets to the world and remain perfectly fine, but when the girls do it, he gets weaker? I'll tell you why. Inconsistency. It's the word that I tend to throw around whenever I talk about plot errors like this, and I will continue to bring that word up repeatedly as future reviews come out because it's the perfect word I can use to describe 75% of the reboot's problems. <laughs> Everyone already knows this. Look, when the dude hands you a note saying he likes you and then you go on to tell him that you like him back but don't want a relationship quite yet, it's not a secret. You know he likes you, he knows you like him, you're both in on it. Everyone else around you is bound to know this already too. That kind of shit spreads throughout a school like wildfire. But yeah, the girls end up defeating the monster anyways and save the day while learning it's not good to go through other people's personal belongings. And the episode ends on a quick cameo that reveals the culprit of the fortune teller to be none other than him. 
Whew, well, that was arduous, I'll say that much. Like I said, I'm really not a fan of this episode for how it rips off lying around the house from the original. Call me petty if you want, but I don't consider this a regular comparison between the two shows. This is blatant copying. Lying did the exact same thing in the way it had a white monster spawn from the girls telling a bunch of lies, which allowed it to grow in strength, so much so that it became powerful enough to start wreaking havoc and spreading lies itself. Which, by the way, were the source of its power, just as the secrets are to this thing, and the girls ultimately defeat the monster by telling the truth. Literally just replace the word lie with secret, and you get this episode. I did like the idea that because the secret swapper is a supernatural item, it wouldn't make sense that it is able to give any answer at any opportune moment and thus convince the girls to tell it all of their secrets. The concept was given some genuine thought, even if the villain itself wasn't. There are some goods and bads that I have to say about him's overall plan as a way of manipulating the girls. Now, I will defend the idea that exposing the girls' deepest secrets and making them paranoid about their private lives getting out is certainly something that he would do. He could use it as a potential bargaining mechanism or a form of blackmail that would force the girls to comply with him or suffer the consequences. The problem is that this episode doesn't do that. Him's last second cameo could be a possible cliffhanger that would lead into a future episode, although based on Viral Spiral's virus bots and Bubbles' cast in Strong Armed, I'm becoming doubtful that this truly means anything. It's probably just thrown in there as an ending to reveal that him was the kid who gave them the swapper in the first place, and nothing more. Similar to Silico's plan from the last episode, this could have been something cunning or devious that could have led somewhere cool, but instead, it's just a talking paper dinosaur revealing the girl's personal information when said information isn't even that bad to begin with. It feels like this was a concept that would have suited the original show perfectly, but it got watered down and softened to fit the modern day trends of this show. I honestly couldn't even recommend that you try this episode because you're better off watching the season 5 episode from the original. Take my word for it. Secret Swapper? More like Secret Flopper, am I right? Huh? Huh? Anyone? No? Oh, okay, well, guess I'll end the video now.